But I have something more to show you today. Oh. You know, we want to take advantage of the next generation of consoles to enter a new genre. You know, the open world online RPG. So this game is brought to you by one of the best studios in the world, Massive Entertainment. I am super excited about it. You know, I think you will be too. It's so amazing. So let's watch it. All right, let's get this out the way at the very beginning. You have every right to be angry about The Division. As I wrote my first draft of this review, I was ultimately writing to two audiences. One of them was the audience that was genuinely interested in what the game was like today, and this group was fine to write for because I could just talk about the game, no problem. The other audience was the group of people who were or are very rightly and very fairly disillusioned, betrayed, pissed off, disappointed, about how much Ubisoft, Massive, and the supporting studios screwed the pooch on The Division. Because yes, they screwed this game up spectacularly from the moment it was announced, and there are literally millions of people today who swear they will never buy another Massive or Ubisoft product ever again. Totally fair. But trying to write a review for both of those audiences just wasn't working. I'd say stuff like, hey, the RPG mechanics are really good now, but then I'd have to follow up immediately by saying, I know, but they should have been good from the start. Or I'd say, the loot economy and build diversity is really functional now. Yeah, but it was so unbalanced for so long. The new free patch is great, I'd say. Yeah, but the DLC didn't even finish the story. Who the fuck even is Aaron Keener? It's not possible for me to celebrate today how great this game now is, while simultaneously at every stop, Tick in the hole, yes, but it should have been that way since launch tick box. I know that these sorts of acknowledgements or caveats peppered throughout the review might make it easier to swallow for those who feel it's important to never forgive and never forget. But ultimately, it makes for a really shitty review given where the game is in 2018. So I'm not going to try and do that. Instead, I'm going to knock it all over at the start here and now and acknowledge what an utter train wreck this game has been since launch so that we can spend the rest of the review talking about how great it is today. Because yes, since the moment The Division was announced on June 10th, 2013, it has largely been a tale of disappointment and frustration. A slam dunk concept botched through obvious downgrades, poor design choices, a misleading DLC structure, horrendous game breaking bugs, PvP issues out the wazoo, and a divided community. Almost every single thing that could have gone wrong with this game went wrong. So as a player, a purchaser, or even just someone watching this game from afar, you have every right to swear off the division and say it's just too damn late to regain any of the hope or trust that you might have felt before. But here's the thing, Ubisoft, Massive, and the other development studios supporting the division could have cut and run a long time ago. Lord knows it would have made a hell of a lot more financial sense for them to cease development on the game after its year one. DLC obligations were met and instead just pour all of their money and effort into the creation of a sequel where they could cynically leverage the notoriously short memory of gamers to have another crack at extracting $100 out of us. But they stuck around and now nearly two years later there's an honest to goodness story to tell here. Now I know that good intentions aren't enough to excuse the pain that we as consumers had to go through. It's been said that Ubisoft releases early access AAA games and that is true and it's not not a good thing. We deserve finished products, functional products when they hit store shelves, and Ubisoft has perhaps been the absolute worst in this regard of any major publisher. Say what you will about Destiny 2 or Call of Duty being rehashed reskins, but those games work, mostly, in a way that Ubisoft titles have long struggled to. But we cannot call out Ubisoft on their issues with quality without simultaneously recognizing them as being one of the leading publishers of the modern era with regards to fixing, supporting, and evolving their games. Rainbow Six Siege sucked on launch, marred by terrible bugs and server architecture, but you'd be stuck with it and today, Siege is arguably the best tactical shooter on the market and one of the most successful, loved and respected ongoing games across any genre. Ghost Recon Wildlands sold a boatload but met mixed critical acclaim and yet you'd be stuck with the game, adding new single player content, a new PvP mode and this weird predator crossover mode thing where you're literally hunting the predator in the jungle because sure why not. For Honor continues to be in a terribly broken state. It's 
just terrible. But the developers have only this month begun the trial of dedicated servers, indicating that they have every intention of sticking with the game in the long term. And Assassin's Creed Origins now continues to offer a number of single player focused events that aim to keep the title alive long after you've already completed its beefy 40 hour campaign. For a long time, the term games as a service has been bandied about by publishers, but it seems that Ubisoft are among the first publishers to try and deliver on the promise of that phrase. I wish Ubisoft games worked out of the box as well. I truly do. But if I had the choice between safe, recycled rubbish and buggy but ambitious titles that matured with time, I'd choose the ambition every time and twice on Sunday. But I understand that this is my choice as a consumer, to place this premium on good intentions and ambition, and to forgive bugs and design choices and whatever else. And you might see it completely differently, and that's your right, and I fully acknowledge it here and now at this point, because from now on in the review, I want to talk about what Ubisoft, Massive, Red Storm, Reflections, and Ubisoft Annecy have accomplished with this game, and why it is now a title worth your time and money. Five years ago, Ubisoft and Massive laid out a vision of an RPG set in the modern day against the backdrop of the end times, allowing us to live out the fantasy of an elite agent who stands alone or with their squad against the evils of a city falling to ruin. Only the enemies weren't just the NPCs, but they were other players as well, or even your own teammates if you weren't careful. And in all of this was the promise that we could play how we wanted. Solo or co-op, PvE or PvP, tank or DPS, frontline or backline, honorable division agent or backstabbing rogue. It was one of the most ambitious propositions in the history of gaming, one that the release product famously fell short of, but now, five years later, we've arrived. Of all the games that have grown and evolved over the recent years, games like Warframe, Rainbow Six Siege, or Path of Exile, The Division now stands proudly among them as a game that has come out the other side of a grueling transformation to emerge triumphant. The Division, now, in January 2018, is spectacular, and it's finally worth every cent you'll pay for it, and then some. It's difficult to succinctly describe the brilliance of The Division in its current form, so I'm not even going to try and be succinct. I'm going to lay it all out for you. The campaign, the open world, the missions, the weapons, the build possibilities, the game modes, the PvE, the PvP, the solo experience, the group experience, all of it. It's one of the few games I've ever played where I can play it five nights a week and do something completely different every single night. And yet each of those activities is connected to the same thematic, mechanical and design core that makes the promise of The Division so alluring. It's taken a long time to happen, but The Division finally feels complete and today I want to show you why. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my review of Tom Clancy's The Division. Stop me if any of this sounds familiar. It's a new role-playing game that isn't about swords and sorcery, or based on someone else's work. In it, you customize a super spy as he travels the world shooting his way through a tangled plot involving underground crime rings and sinister corporations. Unfortunately, an original setting and a few interesting mechanics can't cover up what's otherwise a rough, inconsistent product. The review text is strangely apt, but it's not The Division that IGN are talking about here. Meet Alpha Protocol, the criminally underrated and long-forgotten RPG from Obsidian, makers of Knights of the Old Republic 2, Neverwinter Nights 2, and Fallout New Vegas. The game wasn't perfect, but it tried to do what almost no other game before it had done. Attach the RPG tropes we know and love to a real-world setting. James Bond doesn't use swords, generally speaking. He uses a gun, so let's put some stats on that bad boy and roll with that. A Navy SEAL doesn't study magic. He trains real-world survival, stealth, and combat skills to become a human weapon. So why not just build a skill tree to reflect what that dude studies, and away we go. To be sure, many games have borrowed from the real world to enrich them. The Fallout series is one of the better examples, but the vast majority of it is only a few degrees off the possible. But there's a distinct steampunk, radioactive, apocalyptic vibe to it that's closer to Borderlands than it is to Jason Bourne. And to be honest, the lack of games that go down this path has always been so fascinating to me, given the way that RPG stats have been so superimposed on so many games, especially in the modern era. Call of Duty's various skill trees, weapon stats, mods and the like are all perfect examples of the way that modern day shooters have absorbed so many of the RPG tropes we all take for granted, and yet the RPG genre itself 
has been so unwilling to absorb the shooter tropes that would deliver the kind of RPG that a Call of Duty or Battlefield fan might truly enjoy. But upon closer inspection, it's easy to see why pulling off a real-world RPG is harder than it appears at first glance. I remember reading an interview with the creative director of The Division, Julian Garrity, just prior to the launch of the game back in March 2016, and back then he was asked, what's one thing you want people to know about The Division before it launches? And he responded, it's an RPG. He was so desperate even then for people to understand that this was an RPG first and foremost, and a shooter second, because he knew that when people arrived at the end game, many shooter fans weren't going to feel comfortable with moments like this. A few moments later... Day 2... Day 3... Day four. Sie haben also den Eisman kaltgestellt, huh? If you drew one of those big word cloud things to highlight the way people describe their frustrations with playing the division, the largest word at the very center of it would almost certainly be bullet sponge. The enemies in the division don't have more HP than enemies you face in other games like Diablo or Borderlands or Warframe or whatever else, but there's one key difference. They're just regular humans like you and me. And while we don't mind emptying three or four magazines of ammo into an alien's head, there's something fundamentally unsettling and wrong with doing the same thing to a human head. It just doesn't feel right. I think it's for this reason more than any others that we've seen so few RPGs adopt the real world setting. If we want to let player power scale exponentially at the end game, then enemy health has to scale in a similar way. And it's an almost impossible balance for the developer to maintain. The tension between realism and the mechanics of an RPG fantasy are often strained to breaking point in the division, but no more so than when it comes to enemy health. And I labor this point now for the same reason that Julian did in that interview back in 2016, to stress that the division is first and foremost an RPG, and if you go into it expecting it to feel like a shooter, then you're gonna be disappointed. If the idea of bullet sponge enemies repels you, then you will hate the division, and I strongly urge you to give it a miss. But if you're willing to suspend your disbelief, and you're willing to put in the grind to get the gear to become powerful enough, then there's an immensely rewarding RPG experience waiting for you at the other side of that. But I will say that there's one portion of the game where the developers managed to magically strike the perfect balance between RPG and shooter, a section of the game that almost anyone will enjoy, and it's during the game's awesome campaign. From the moment you're activated as a division agent to the moment you complete the final mission and stare at the endless abyss of the end game, the campaign grabs you by the scruff of the neck and pulls you through dozens of missions and side missions and settings and events that are just awesome. It's not long, you could probably knock it over in about 10 to 12 hours, maybe less, but it's always well paced, you can do it solo or with up to three other friends the whole way through, and I honestly cannot recommend it more highly, it is just fantastic. And the best part about it is, it just feels so right. The campaign is the first time you're exposed to the top tier, truly exceptional third person animations that this team brought to the table, and what is easily the most functional cover system ever introduced into a video game. You can literally target your next point of cover, trigger the animation to run to it while simultaneously reloading your weapon, using an ability and panning your camera around to look for the next threat. It's simply the best third person mechanics on the market today and they always feel wonderful no matter what you're doing. But the greatness extends to the rest of the experience as well. Weapons have just the right amount of recoil. Enemy time to kill is short and snappy. The damage you take is just the right amount to make the game challenging without punishing you unfairly. And all the while the loot drop system is firing on all cylinders with a regular stream of upgrades providing you with bonus power that you can actually feel and that have a tangible impact on your ability to face the next challenge coming your way. Like any other RPG, the endgame cannot maintain this linear power progression curve and in the endgame it quickly plateaus into a much more rock paper scissors style approach where the focus is on bringing the right build to the table to be most effective either solo or in a group. It's satisfying in its own way but it never feels as satisfying and as awesome as the campaign does, so savor it while it lasts. But one area of the campaign and one area of the 
game in general that really continues to be overlooked is its storytelling. I had lunch with Julian Garrity at E3 in 2016, and when we sat down, the first thing I asked him was why the hell The Division had such a light touch and meandering approach to storytelling. See, there are a few cutscenes throughout the campaign, but most of them do very little to advance the narrative of this game. Julian told me that because the game was open world and because people could complete different missions in different orders, it was important for the story to form around the player rather than for the game to dictate a specific linear narrative that they were shuttled through. As a result, the threadbare campaign plot is just window dressing for the story of the city, the island of Manhattan, the people who occupy it and how all of it fell to pieces at the hands of this unidentified virus and enemy factions seeking to bring order in their own way. If you go into the division hoping for a Witcher 3 or Mass Effect or Horizon Zero Dawn level story, you're going to be very disappointed. It is unfinished and it is a frustrating cliffhanger at the end, and the DLC does not advance the story in any way, shape, or form, which is a shame, because there's actually a really great narrative there waiting to be finished. So just like you have to accept bullet sponges in The Division, you have to accept that this isn't the sort of game that will leave you reeling in your chair when the credits roll. So if you're okay with that, then I'd recommend going into it as you would with Zelda Breath of the Wild. There is a story in Zelda, but it's the world that's the star of the show in Breath of the Wild. The old ruins and the topography and the villages you stumble upon and the shrines you explore. Like Breath of the Wild's Hyrule, the Division's world is desolate and beautiful, and through its expertly written and narrated audio logs, you'll learn so much more about this world than if you just race from cutscene to cutscene, and it's a vastly more intelligent and immersive means of conveying a story than a cutscene can typically achieve. But of course, it's not for everyone. My advice if you're up for it, take your time through the campaign, enjoy the world, look around, soak it in, and chase down the audio logs and documents littered throughout the game world. They're absolutely worth your time and a fantastic compliment to an already excellent campaign experience. But as great as the campaign is, I know that for most of you, it's just an appetizer for the main course, the end game. And the endgame is so vastly different in The Division that arriving there after you've finished the campaign can give you a very jarring sense of whiplash. So, let's take some time now to understand what it's all about so that you can decide for yourself whether or not it's something you'd want to put your time into. Of all the video game genres out there, the looter has got to be the dumbest of the lot. I mean, think about it, right? Multiplayer shooters test our skill and cooperation. MOBAs test our strategic thinking. Driving games test our precision. Story-driven RPGs or action-adventure games give us set pieces and characters and moments that delight. And then we have the looter, where our job is essentially to click on the same enemies and the same levels over and over again in the hope that one day a house will drop and I can go back to enjoying this game instead of farming this goddamn piece of- so anyway, as I was saying, looters suck, and that's a fact, right? Well, not really. They certainly suck for a number of people. The grinding games like Warframe, Path of Exile, Diablo, and Borderlands is the defining aspect of those games. It's entirely about doing almost identical activities repeatedly so that you can acquire more gear, so that you can then do slightly more powerful versions of those identical activities. Some of you listening to me describe that have already fallen asleep, just imagining how boring that must be, but if you're anything like me, then your brain is tingling all over with glee, synapses firing as you nostalgically recall that time where some crossbow dropped on your 8,000th run of a dungeon. Those are good times if you're up for it, and they're the absolute worst if you're not. So let's be clear about this so you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Tom Clancy's The Division is the closest thing to third-person Diablo on the market today, other than Path of Exile, which is in fact Diablo, it's just a better version of it. The end game of this game is tremendously diverse, which we'll get into soon, but the heart and soul of the PvE game is walking into a bunch of dudes, shooting them in the face for 10 minutes, going back to base, and then spending 20 minutes going through your bags to work out if any of the shit that you just got was an upgrade or maybe a side grade or maybe if I change this stat on the gloves to this and then swap the backpack with this and then I change the stamina mod to an electronic so I can still hit the requirements for competent which means wait wait stop stop it's happening again 
Yes, you will run the same missions over and over again. You will kill Alex and Dylan no less than 800 million times, but by God, when you are done, you will have some loot to show for it. And for those of you that played this game at launch and left soon after that, then this is probably a big surprise because it wasn't always so. If you quit the division any time before patch 1.4, which was on the 25th of October last year, then you were playing the worst possible version of it for a whole bunch of reasons, but especially because 1.4 fixed the loot distribution model. Instead of specific loot pieces dropping from specific places, any loot could drop anywhere. And pretty much anything that did drop, dropped a whole bunch of it. That's why the parallels to Diablo are so apt here. You can get specific drops from doing certain things in Diablo, but most of the time you're just doing whatever you like because the loot pool is spread across the entire content of the game. But patch 1.4 borrowed something else from Diablo that was important, selectable difficulties. See, in Diablo, you can set the difficulty for any content in the game, and the higher you set it, the more challenging and rewarding it becomes, the better the loot is that you receive. Well, it's the same for the division as well. When you ding level 30 and reach the end game, you're gonna start out in world tier one, and as you collect items and gain item level, you'll eventually be able to move up to world tier five, which is where 95% of the player base is at any time. The path from tier one to tier Tier 5 is really short by the way, probably just a few hours, so don't be worried that you have weeks of grinding ahead of you before you eventually reach the true end game. And the division's difficulty scaling goes even further than this, since within each world tier, each PvE activity has a selectable difficulty that further increases the rewards you get from them. And while the normal to challenge mode difficulties just add more enemies and more HP, certain missions go all the way up to legendary difficulty, which completely changes those missions, adding new enemy types and vastly different and more challenging AI. The legendary missions are some of my favorite to run with a proper group because they're actually really tricky and incredibly satisfying to complete. The beauty of these scaling and selectable difficulties is that you can tune the game to be exactly what you want it to be for whatever you're doing. If you're running with a highly geared experienced squad then jack the difficulty and crunch through the toughest content the game has to offer. Or maybe you're just playing solo testing out some weird off meta build you're putting together. Just lower the difficulty and enjoy yourself. You won't get as many rewards, but you'll always get something useful to you, which means you're never wasting your time. And the fact that you can do whatever you want and be rewarded for it is so important in The Division because there is a staggering amount of content available to you in this game right now. Here's how an average week might look for you in The Division if you're a casual player such as myself. Tuesday. Weekly missions have reset, which is great because they award me heaps of useful items and currencies. Let's start chipping away at those by completing the daily mission and underground challenges. There's too much content for me to be able to finish in a single night, so I'll have to come back another day. Wednesday. Hey, my squad's on tonight. Let's knock over the legendary incursions and missions since they guarantee me an exotic item the first time I do them each week. Thursday. I'm all alone tonight. I think I'll do some high value target missions, which are missions set out in the incredibly detailed open world world. Maybe I'll finish off with some match made last stand PvP matches for a bit of fun as well. Friday. All right, squad's on again. Time to hit the dark zone to grind division tech, hunt rogue agents or go rogue ourselves. Whatever we like. Saturday. Ah, good. Vendors have reset, giving me the chance to get some really well-rolled items. I'll check the Reddit to see if anything's good and then grab it, and then I might knock over the rest of my weekly mission requirements. Sunday. I just broke up with my girlfriend because I'm too busy playing The Division. I'll spend the day grinding the underground, doing PvP survival runs, which is basically like PUBG inside The Division, by the way. I'll run a few rounds of Resistance, which is basically like Call of Duty Zombies, in the division, by the way. Skirmish, which is another match made 4v4 game mode. I'll check out the new Westside Piers area, which was added free in the recent content patch. And then I'll spend like three hours going through and redoing all of my gear loadouts since I've collected a ton of loot this week and the inventory management in this game is pretty much a full-time job. Monday, eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, prepare for weekly resets tomorrow. <laughs> So that's a complete week of content there and very little of it was repeated and so much of it has an inherent diversity to it as well. The legendary missions AI is so full on that they almost never behave the same way twice. The survival game mode will always drop you in different places and other players hoping to extract will impact your game in both PvE and PvP. The dark zone is never the same place twice and the match made PvP activities bring a different experience every time you play. And if any of that does start to feel repetitive, just put on a different gear set and play it in a completely 
completely different way with different weapons, gear perks, and abilities. It may sound like I'm exaggerating here, but I'm really not. There's still plenty to complain about in the division, like its horrendous inventory management, weapon and gear balance issues, the mod system, and Hamish's choice of shirts. I mean, what the fuck even is this? But repetitiveness is not a charge that you could lay squarely at the feet of the division. There is just too much to do now, and combined with adjustable difficulties, it makes one of the most compelling endgame offerings on the market today. The endgame here transcends what the looter genre is typically capable of and is far more akin to an MMO like World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV. But unlike other looters on the market today, like Diablo or Warframe, it offers a truly functional PvP game that you can reliably turn to if you happen to get bored at any point. And that's a pretty big deal if you ask me. But The Division's PvP is not for the faint of heart. It is a fascinatingly specific experience that will drive you nuts unless you understand how it works. So, let's get to it, shall we? <laughs> it's really, really hard to get PvP right in a video game. It's been done dozens, hundreds of times over the years, but for every successful PvP game, there are around 100 others that have failed to capture an audience. PvP is hard to design because players are very, very good at breaking whatever a video game designer builds. The studio may have a vision for how a certain ability or mechanic may work, but players will find a way to use it in ways that developers never could have imagined. So just delivering on the basics is hard enough, but bugs and exploits aside, there's a design decision that the overwhelming majority of PvP games make when they put themselves out into the market, and that's to remove or reduce the impact of grindable gear in PvP encounters. See, in Dota, gear makes a huge difference over the course of a game, but every match of Dota starts out with everyone having the same gear, or none really. You can't grind for 10,000 hours and then start a match with better gear than your opponent, and this way it's down to individual skill every single match. Most games adopt this approach. While games like Siege or COD or Battlefield or whatever have unlockables that affect your combat prowess, the impact is pretty minor and you can unlock the stuff you want pretty fast. These are still skill-based games at their core. The Division is not like this at all. The first and most important thing I will say about The Division's PvP is that it is strongly tilted in favor of hardcore players who have invested hundreds or thousands of hours grinding the ideal gear sets, weapons and mods because the stats on your gear have a tremendous impact on the outcome of PvP engagements. The Division's PvP has perhaps the highest barrier to entry of any AAA game, because not only do you have to be good at it, but you also need to have invested the time to get the necessary gear to be truly competitive. And if you're not willing or able to invest that time, you're going to really struggle to truly enjoy yourself in PvP because you can't rely on skill alone to carry you over the line. Now, don't get me wrong, skill is certainly a factor. There are some great PvPers out there who will be able to comfortably mop the floor with you even if they are undergeared. But when two equally skilled opponents meet on the battlefield, gear will be the determining factor in that engagement. And that's a very different proposition to most other games you're probably playing right now. In the past, the developers have done some work to curb the impact of the gear advantage in the PvP game. They added a game mode called Last Stand, which is part of the third paid DLC, as well as a 4v4 skirmish game mode, which is free to all players as of the recent patch 1.8. Both of these game modes will normalize your gear stats, meaning that they will take the stat rolls on your gear and roll them up to the maximum roll. If your gear isn't quite as optimized as the next person, you'll still be on an equal footing if you're wearing the same gear that brings the same bonuses, which is good because it reduces the need to grind for better gear and better stat rolls on that gear, or the need to optimize your rolls at the newly added optimization station, which was also added in patch 1.8. But here's the thing, and this is one of my biggest complaints about The Division in its current form from patch 1.7. The developers introduced what are called classified gear sets. These are essentially better versions of normal gear sets 
and have six piece bonuses that are incredibly powerful and they're almost all enabled in PvP as well. Since these six piece bonuses are not stat rolls, gear normalization doesn't do anything to curb the impact of these gear sets. They're straight up the best gear to bring to any PvP situation and they are what heavily tilt the PvP experience towards the more hardcore because getting a full set of classified gear is not easy. It requires dozens of hours of grinding and the most efficient way to do that is during one of the monthly global events which are a week-long event held every month that essentially just increases your chances of getting classified gear. And the best thing to do during that week and the most efficient is just to run a specific mission over and and over again, Lexington, since it awards the most global event currency for every hour of time invested. Sadly, where classified gear sets should have been an awesome addition to the game, the way the classified gear has been introduced is just really not great. The fact that the six piece bonuses are not disabled in PvP corrupts the PvP experience by pushing it out of the reach of those who haven't invested the time. And the fact that the best way to get them is through boring, repetitive grinding casts a long, dark and disappointing shadow over an otherwise really awesome and diverse PvE experience. So that's just my view on that, but there's a counter view to everything that I've just said, and that's the fact that The Division is one of the few games on the market today that actually rewards you for grinding. And while I personally don't like that, a lot of people do, and we need to acknowledge that as well. If every single other game on the market today actively reduces the impact of the grind, surely there should be at least one game out there that lets the grind means something in PvP, right? Well, yeah, sure. If that's your thing, then The Division is one of the few spaces in all of gaming where this is possible, and that's absolutely a good thing if that's the sort of experience you're chasing. And I think that there's something in this that truly sets The Division apart in 2018, and that's the fact that it's a AAA game that truly treats you like an adult. The Dark Zone is one of the harshest and most unforgiving environments in gaming today. There are a whole bunch of people in there who don't want to get Division tech or gear. They just want to fuck up some other person's day and they can multi-group and they can spawn camp and they can spam over your corpse they can type in trade chat and they can even trash talk you over VoIP where did they go oh they're still up here oh like butter, yeah. oh my god he just one shot you other developers like riot and bungie and blizzard have declared their wars on toxicity and they go to extraordinary lengths to stop players from griefing each other destiny 2 doesn't even have a region chat on pc in its social spaces for fear that people might use cuss words in it massive say fuck that they literally built a giant playground specifically designed for toxicity and they let the player choose whether or not they want to take part in that. In 2018, it's nice to not be babied, and I've come to appreciate this a lot more than I did when I first stepped into the Dark Zone nearly two years ago. And I'll say this as well, if you play The Division at launch, you felt very forced into the Dark Zone because it was the best place to gear up and it was the only place to PvP. Personally, I hate the Dark Zone. I don't enjoy it at all, but I haven't had to go there for a long time because the game no longer forces me to, which means that the only people stepping in there are those who are signed up for what it's offering, meaning that the community as a whole is now a lot less divided than it was in the past, where PvE players were clashing with PvP players and each of them were both seeking very different things. I'm not going to say I enjoy the Division's PvP because frankly I don't. I don't like its focus on gear over skill, I don't like PvPing in the third person, and I don't like the Dark Zone, but I will say that I respect the PvP game immensely because it's a unique offering, and I understand why a lot of people enjoy PvPing in this game. It does things that other games don't, either because they can't, or because they're too afraid to. And for that, I give it a hell of a lot of credit. On March 9th, 2017, the developers of The Division announced on a live stream that the year two content schedule would consist of some pretty basic and anemic content. There'd be no year two season pass, no new areas opened up on the map, no continuation of the story, not much of anything really. A number of people covering the game on YouTube or Twitch announced that they would be quitting the game and I posted up a video saying this. Don't expect that the second DLC is going to be magically larger and more exciting and, me and more revitalizing than the first one because that doesn't make any commercial sense. This first DLC drop is your, pl is your chance 
to say to the player base, guys, we're with you, there's gonna be a big game ahead, don't go anywhere, to make that bold statement, not just to that community, but to the whole gaming community, say, the division is here to stay, and to really keep that game thriving. If that was your intent, that's what you would do. You wouldn't let a very large portion of your player base hemorrhage as will happen now with this announcement. You don't wait until the end of the year, Christmas time, Destiny 2, whatever, and say, oh, by the way, guys, we're gonna do a huge content drop here. We're gonna try and compete with the best newest games on the market with a gigantic DLC drop. That's not gonna happen, guys. See, now this is why you don't trust YouTubers. Seriously, though, I've never been more happy to have been completely wrong. The recent patch 1.8 that we got from the various studios contributing to it is just phenomenal. It adds the West Side Piers, which is this beautifully detailed open world exploration area. The best the game has to offer, in fact. It brings the new skirmish 4v4 PvP game mode, the new horde mode style resistance game mode set on the USS Intrepid aircraft carrier. It brings significant changes to the underground game mode, changes to the rogue system in the dark zone to make it a lot less frustrating in some ways, but admittedly more frustrating and others. It brings the new gear optimization station, enabling you to min-max your build without having to constantly pray to the RNG gods, and new exotic weapons that offer interesting and unique build diversity opportunities. There is a mountain of bug fixes and quality of life improvements in there as well that go a long way towards making the game a lot more reliable and enjoyable than it's ever been before. Best of all, everything I listed here, except for the underground improvements, are completely free to all players. If you bought the game and you don't have any of the DLC, you get all of that for free, and that's pretty fucking cool in 2018. In the video I showed you a moment ago, which I recorded back in March this year, I talked about the fact that Destiny 2 was on its way, and it would likely crush what remained of the Division's player base, but again, completely wrong here. Destiny 2's release has been only marginally less disappointing than that of Star Wars Battlefront 2, as Bungie shoved out an incomplete game and stuffed it full to bursting with loot boxes. Destiny 2's PvP player base is now the lowest it has ever been, even though the game is now available on PC for the first time. It marks a tragic fall from grace from a studio that worked so hard to improve Destiny 1 and evolve it into an incredible game, only to surrender all of that hard-fought brand loyalty and respect in exchange for strong launch sales and a new microtransaction platform. I raise all of this now because the Division's journey now very closely mirrors that of Vanilla Destiny. The launch product was famously substandard, but the developers worked hard to improve the game, and now it's in a great place. But that evolution poses a new challenge that Bungie failed to meet with the release of their sequel. Namely, that if a Division sequel is coming, and I strongly suspect that it is, it's almost impossible to imagine the game that we get on day one will be as feature-rich as the game we have today. Games like Warframe, Path of Exile, and Siege have abandoned the sequel path because they continue to grow and evolve with time. Sequels just don't make sense when you're onto such a good thing. Well, The Division is now onto a very, very good thing, and my hope is that the support for this game continues long into the future, or that if a sequel is in the works, that it brings as much forward as possible because there is a lot here worth keeping. The Division is in full bloom now. The template laid down by this game makes it, finally, one of the best looter shooters on the market today and a terrific game by any measure. It is absolutely not for everyone, but if it is your kind of game, then it's likely to be one of the most rewarding and memorable gaming experiences you will ever have. It's been a very long and bumpy road to get to this point, but we're here now, and it's amazing to see that vision outlined all those years ago, finally realizing. Woo, man, I'm glad that's out the way. That was about two weeks worth of work to put that video together. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Obviously it meant a lot to me since Division was the game that got my start on YouTube. And it's uh, almost two years to the day that I uploaded my first video. So I really hope you enjoyed this review. I've also prepared something a little bit special. I've worked with a graphic artist to put the script into a special, you know, document thingy, all nice, proper layouts with screenshots and stuff and box outs and things. It's just a nice little, uh, you know, 
keepsake for uh, this review and it's the kind of thing I actually hope to do for reviews going forward as well. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I'm going to make it available to patrons. Uh, I'm going to be putting a link to my Patreon down below. So uh, check that out if you're interested. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Uh, really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope that it did the game justice. And if you're thinking about picking up the game, I really encourage you to do so because uh, it's, it's in a really great place. And I think uh, there's a lot to enjoy. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. Take good care and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.